Hi everyone, I am Michele Ciampi and I'm going to talk about oblivious transfer from chapter permutations in minimal rounds. This is a joint work with Arka Raichanduri, Vipu Goyal, Abhishek Jain and Rafael Ostrowski. With secure multi-party computation, what we want to do is uh, evaluating a two-input function in a secure way. Uh, more precisely, we consider the general setting where we have two parties, Alice and Bob, uh, which have a private input, and they want to evaluate the function f over this private input. Uh, they do not trust each other, and they do not want to give this input, uh, and each party does not want to give uh, its own input to the other party. So one trivial way to solve this problem would be to say and assume that there is a trusted party uh, to which both Alice and Bob can send their own input. And this trusted party then is delegated to compute the function f over those inputs and give back uh, the output of the computation to Alice and Bob. But it's not um, realistic to assume the existence of such a trusted party since I mean, this central node uh, might fail or might collude with either uh, Alice or Bob. So what we want to do, uh, we want to design a protocol uh, which is described by a set of messages that Alice and Bob exchange over a communication channel in such a way that at the end of this communication, uh, Alice and Bob get the correct output of the, of the computation. And moreover, uh, in the case where one of the two parties is corrupted, the corrupted party should not learn more than what can be inferred from the output of the function itself. All the protocols we propose in our paper that are secure in the simulation-based paradigm are proven secure with respect to um, black box adversaries. So the simulator can only query um, the adversary and he does not know uh, the code of, of the adversary. In the first part and in the main uh, part of the talk, uh, we will be focusing on a very specific uh, functionality. This is called the uh, oblivious transfer functionality. Uh, the idea here is that the input of Bob is made of two uh, strings or two bits for simplicity, uh, and the uh, input of Alice is just one bit. Uh, the uh, functionality that we want to compute will return to Alice just the string of Bob with index B, in this case, uh, CB. Unfortunately, we know that we uh, cannot realize in the play model this functionality uh, with uh, uh, information theoretic security. Um, so we need to rely on computational assumptions. So to be precise, we can have um, statistical security only against one party, but, if, but we cannot get statistical security against, uh, against both parties. So one way to, to circumvent uh, these uh, impossibility result is to, again, rely on computational assumptions. And what we consider in this work is the assumption that one-way permutations exist. So one-way permutation is, first of all, a permutation, as you can imagine, and is described by a set of algorithms. The first is just a generation algorithm that uh, takes this input, the unary description of the security parameter, and uh, it returns um, the description of a function g and a value t, which we will call the trapdoor. Uh, the properties of, uh, a, tra of a one way trapdoor permutations are that given uh, a function a g and given a, a value x, it's easy to uh, compute the g of x but it's hard to invert a randomly sampled element y. In addition, a one-way one uh, trapdoor permutation is equipped by a special algorithm uh, that we call trap, which on input any value y and the trapdoor can easily invert, um, can easily find the pre-image of uh, y. In the work of Ivan et al., 
in 1982, the authors show how to obtain a three-round oblivious transfer protocol that is secure against semi-honest adversaries. Moreover, this protocol can be proven secure against malicious senders under the assumption that the function, the trapdoor function, is certifiable. That is, it is required that any party, by just inspecting the description of the function, can claim whether the function is indeed a permutation or not. katsus in 2004 proves that five rounds are necessary to realize any non-trivial functionality, and they match this lower bound by proposing a two-party computation protocol relying only on certifiable trapdoor permutations. In the work of Ossorsky et al. in 2015, the authors show how to achieve the same result, but this time relying on the underlying crypto primitive in a black box way. Trapdoor permutations have been used also to realize other interesting primitives like non-interactive zero-knowledge, and Bellar Jung in 1993 showed how to construct an interactive zero knowledge relying on trapdoor permutations without requiring this uh, form of certifiability. And this uh, work was later um, improved and extended uh, by the work of Kanet et al. in TCC 2018. And so, what we do in, uh, in this work is to try to understand whether we can do the same. Uh, for the case of oblivious transfer and more in general two-party uh, computation, that is we want to show uh, how to obtain um, a round optimal two-party computation protocol without requiring the trapdoor permutation to be certifiable. So, assuming that we know how to generate a trapdoor permutation, EGL82 showed that um, you can realize the oblivious transfer functionality in the following way. So Bob, which will act as the sender, will sample uh, a trapdoor permutation uh, together with, with the trapdoor, and it will send the description of the function to Alice. So for simplicity here in this example, I'm assuming that the input of Alice is 1, but you will see that it's, it's, it's basically the same thing when the input of Alice is, is 0. So given that the input of Alice is 1, what Alice will do, Alice will sample a random element x1 from the domain of the, one, of the, of the permutation, and uh, she will evaluate the g uh, of x1. And she will sample another element and she will send to Bob uh, y0 and y1. So the observation here is that basically Alice has sampled this element in such a way that she knows the, e pre the pre-image of only one of those. At this point, uh, Bob, which has the trapdoor, can invert both y0 and y1. He will get x0 and x1. And he will compute a one-time bet of his own secrets. Um, the first secret uh, is encrypted, let's say, using x0, and the second secret using x1. And he will send back to Alice these encryptions. Now, the observation here is that since Alice knows uh, x1, she can compute uh, c1, because she can just remove the, the, uh, the key from this encryption and get c1. Now, of course, uh, it's easy to see that if uh, uh, Alice, the receiver, is, is corrupted, then like this protocol is not secure anymore because nothing in this protocol prevents Alice from just sampling x0 and x1 and then evaluating the function over g and thus, thus getting y0 and y1 so that she can then get both secrets from both. The nice thing about this protocol is that if Bob instead is corrupted, then he cannot get any information about Alice's input. Indeed, if G is a permutation, the only information that the adversary sees is Y0 and Y1. And Y0 and Y1, they have distributed exactly in the same way. So their distribution is independent from the input of Alice. So a corrupted Bob cannot infer anything about Alice's input. 
But what we should observe here is that this claim is true only if G is a permutation. Indeed, it might be that if G is not a permutation, then uh, we might be in the situation where Alice might figure this out, so she could refuse to participate to the process. Okay, so and if a trapdoor permutation has this property, we say that the trapdoor permutation is self certifiable because just by inspection, we, Alice can efficiently say whether it's a permutation. But what if instead the, the, the function does not have this property? And indeed, we know that there are trapdoor permutations that are, uh, that are not self certifiable. So, as I said, in the case where G is a permutation, we are good. And so in this example here, G is a permutation, okay? And as I argued before, there is nothing uh, the adversary can do to infer the input of Alice in this case. But now consider the following. So consider the case where there are collisions, let's say. So a collision is where, for example, B2 has two brain images, okay? And uh, we have a second collision, which is uh, a B3, because B3 has uh, two collisions. So collisions like when two or more elements evaluated on G um, are mapped to the same element of the of the domain. Okay. Now we can observe the following. So if Alice wants to get the input of Bob with index one. Then she will take x1 and then she will evaluate g on x1. But now, now observe that this means that y1 can only be equal to b2, b3, and b5. So y1 will never be equal to b1, for example, because there is no element that from um, that from the um, domain is mapped to uh, B1. On the other hand, for the uh, input that uh, Alice does not, not want to get, which is in this case the input uh, that the, the the input with uh, with the index of zero, she will pick a random uh, a random y from the from the domain. And in this case, I mean, she is just sampling a random value, so this means that y0 might be equal I mean, to b1, to b5, to, to any of, of these ones, right? So now the distribution of y0 and y1 is really dependent on what is the input of Alice, right? And so in this case, a malicious adversity might be able to distinguish easily by just looking at y0 and y1, um, what is the input of Alice. So how do we solve this problem? Um, a candidate solution would be to say, well, let's use zero knowledge because uh, what we can do is that we can force Bob to provide a zero knowledge proof that shows that G is indeed sampled using the generation algorithm. And then we would be fine. One problem of this approach is that if we don't want to increase the run complexity of this protocol here, which consists of just three rounds, then we, we have a problem because either we rely on heuristic assumptions and we obtain to obtain non-interactive zero knowledge or if you want to stay in the play model we need at least four rounds to compute a zero knowledge a zero knowledge proof so the overall around the complexity in, in the best case we can hope for to by using this zero knowledge approach is um, six uh, rounds another approach would be to use cut and choose where the um, party the receiver challenges the, the sender by, for example, sampling multiple elements from the, the, from the codomain and asking the, the, the sender, Bob, to, to invert those and so that uh, Alice can get a level of confidence about how good this, uh, this permutation is. The problem is that, again, this would require some additional rounds because like Alice needs to make sure that G is a permutation before she sends uh, Y0 and Y1. And as you can imagine here, uh, there is no room um, to do the cut and choose unless we increase the number of rounds of the protocol. 
So what we do, we take a completely uh, different approach in the sense that the observation here is that Bob can get something about Alice's input by inspecting y0 and y1 when g is not a permutation. So the idea would be to do the following, to encrypt, to keep hidden the second round of Alice for the case where g is not a permutation. So the idea is to put us ourselves in a win-win situation where either the function is a permutation, so and the adversary can see what is encrypted in the second round, but but in this case it's okay if the adversary can see what is encrypted because well g is a permutation so y zero and y one does not give away anything about Alice's input. On the other hand, if g is not a permutation, then this encryption should retain um, the the secrecy of uh, y zero and y one. To be more precise, what we want. To design is an encryption uh, scheme that is uh, defined by the algorithm uh, encryption and decryption, where the encryption algorithm just takes as input the description of the trapped permutation and the message we want to encrypt, whereas the decryption algorithm takes as input again the description of the function, the trapped T, and the ciphertext we want to decrypt. And the idea is that again, if G is, is a permutation, then we can like always decrypt K, the ciphertext, using the trapter. If instead G is not a permutation, and to be precise, what you will prove is that if there are G has a lot of collision, so for example, two to the uh, n minus one uh, collisions, so then M remains it hidden. So the message um, that we want to protect is protected, but we need a lot of collision. So this is how the final protocol would look like. So instead of Alice sending in the clear y1 and y0, she will encrypt y0 and y1 using this a special encryption scheme. And now because of the properties of this encryption scheme, like we can get some stronger security guarantee where if the function has a lot of collision, then the security of this encryption scheme will not disclose anything about y0 and y1 and the input of Alice is protected. We need to discuss what happens in the case where there are not that many collision. So where the function g is still not a permutation, but we have less than two to the n minus one collisions, but we will do later on. Uh, I just want to show you now first how this encryption um, scheme uh, works. To encrypt a message M, we just sample a random element from the domain and we compute a one time path. I mean, what we do precisely is to use the hardcore um, predicate of the, of the trapdoor function, but for simplicity, let's say that we just sample the random element and we, we, do the, like, we use it as a key of a one time path to encrypt them. Then, we evaluate uh, G of A. And the ciphertext, it's simply just these two elements. So the one time pad of uh, the message using A and the evaluation of A over G. For the decryption, first of all, we can invert the second element of this ciphertext that we denoted with K2, and we can retrieve A. And once that we have, have A, we can just um, remove the one time by key of, from this encryption, let's say, and we can get the message that we want to compute. It's very, very simple. And now, of course, like when G is a permutation, well, we have uh, no problems at all, right? So in this example, during the encryption, let's say that the random element is A3, so we can compute A3 plus M. And uh, then we follow eight a three over over the over the trap of permutation g, and we get b three. And the output of our um, of our encryption is just m um, plus uh, plus a three comma uh, comma b three. And we can decrypt. Uh, and the reason why we can decrypt is that like b three has exactly one preimage, so there is no ambiguity 
in the decryption. On the other hand, if we are in the case where G is not a permutation and has a lot of collisions, and let's say that again, like we are during the encryption, we sample A3, but now observe that A3 maps to B3, which has two pre images. So now, even if the decryptor has the uh, trapter, he doesn't know whether during the encryption A3 or A4 was used to compute uh, the ciphertext. So this creates an ambiguity that keeps hidden the message M. Okay, so let's see what we, we have now. So again, we are in the situation where Alice does not just send in the clear Y01, but she encrypts those using this encryption scheme we've just described. And if Bob is uh, uh, honest, then he can compute the decryption using the knowledge of the trapter. We said that uh, in two situations, this scheme is secure. The first is where G is a permutation, and the second is where G is not a permutation and it has a lot of collisions, right? Because we can prove that if uh, half of the domain has collisions, then uh, the encryption scheme is semantically secure. But what happens, for example, in this case, where there are just a few collisions, right? I mean, the problem here is that we might be in the situation where the adversary can successfully decrypt the second round. But on the other hand, maybe um, because of these uh, few collisions, Alice was unlucky and she got uh, some of those. And then like the adversary can, again, infer something by just inspect inspecting Y0 and Y1. But the observation here is that there aren't many collisions. So we are finding in the, in, the, in the two extreme cases where G is a permutation, where G has a lot of collisions. But if you are in this middle ground, it means that there are not that many collisions. So it means that, let's say, the, pro, the, the number of collisions is less than 2 to the n minus 1. So we can argue that then the probability that Y0 and Y1 sampled by Alice using either of uh, the two procedures um, they are good, so they have no collisions. And the probability that this happens in this case, for example, is at least 1 over 4. Because like half of the domain has collisions, so with probability 1 over 2, Alice will get like a value that uh, uh, has exactly one pre-image. But we, we want to get two of these values, so uh, the probability becomes 1, one over 4. So what we can do then is the following. So we can try to amplify this probability that Alice gets good, let's say, values in the, in the second round of the protocol. And one way to amplify this type of probability is by just repeating the protocol many times. So if we repeat this protocol many, many times, um, some uh, lambda square times where the uh, lambda is the security parameter, then we know that uh, at least in one of these execution of the protocol, we will have like good uh, values of y0 and y1. So we will end up in the situation where in at least in one of these executions, we will have y0 and y1 with exactly one pre image each. Um, unfortunately, this approach doesn't work because yeah, it's true that we will have one execution where uh, that will be somehow, uh, we can say it, it's secure in the sense that it will protect the input of Alice. But on the other hand, there are other executions that are not like that. And so given that we are just repeating the protocol and Alice is using the same input in all the protocols, well, the fact that one, only one of these executions, uh, it, it's fine, it's not broken, uh, it doesn't really help. So what we can do is that we can rely on an idea similar to um, OT combiners. Let me give you a brief recap of what an OT combiner is. Let's say that we have um, different realization, different protocol realizations of the oblivious transfer functionality. So in this case, 
let's say we have n protocols they use different assumptions they have different procedures for the receiver and for the sender they differ in some way and what an ot combiner does more precisely what an one uh, one out of m ot combiner does is to take all these instances and construct one protocol that again realizes the oblivious transfer functionality so the property of the combiner is that as long as in this specific example here there is one oblivious transfer instantiation that is secure that is not that is not broken then the overall protocol that we get the overall ot protocol that the ot combiner gives us is secure so we do not need to know which of the OT protocol is, is secure, and we can still get an overall protocol that uh, uh, that is secure um, by just combining these multiple uh, OT OT protocols. Okay, in in some way, our approach is to look at the specific instantiation of an OT combiner and apply it to our case in order to. Uh, amplify the probability that at least one execution will be fine, and at the same time protecting the input of values, even if the remaining two executions are completely broken because of the uh, of the choice of the of the function made by the sender. And the idea is pretty simple, as you can imagine. So instead of requiring Alice to use the same input in all the executions, Alice will secret share in, in some way, I mean, in some meaningful way, um, her input B among these many executions. And Bob also does something similar. He, he, he does some type of secret sharing in such a way that at the end of these many executions, uh, she can combine the outputs received from these many uh, OT executions and she will uh, be able to, to reconstruct the final output. And the nice thing is that because of the security that the combiner gives you, it doesn't matter if there are other executions that are broken, as long as there is one that is good and that where we know that the Y values has one brain image each. So just to summarize, to argue that our protocol is secure, we can distinguish between three different main cases that can happen. So the first is the case where in one of these executions, the, um, uh, the sender uses a, a trapter function that has at least two to the n minus one collisions. So in this case, we would be fine because like the, one share of Alice will be protected because of the semantic security of the encryption scheme we have designed. If such an execution does not exist, then we can say that, well, this means that uh, each function that, that the adversary uses, that the sender uses, contains at most two to the n minus one minus one collisions. Okay. If the number of, of repetition now is big enough, we can argue that with overwhelming probability, one OT execution will have y zero and y one with exactly one pre image each. So, okay, and, and this basically gives us uh, a three-round uh, OT protocol that doesn't require the function g to be self-certifiable. So we remove the certifiability property and we keep the run complexity of the protocol down to three. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the protocol unfortunately remains insecure in the case where the, the receiver is uh, not semi-honest. If the receiver is, is corrupted, is malicious, then he can always get um, both secrets. And to solve this issue, we need to add another round to the protocol. And um, our approach will follow the uh, approach used in the work of Strasky et al. of Crypto 2015. Um, but we need to do it with some, some care um, because we also want to um, keep the protocol uh, black box in the use of the underlying chapter permutation. So this is... Um, Another challenge that uh, that we need to overcome, but 
uh, we uh, we managed to do that. And uh, for this, uh, I will refer to to the paper for for more details. Just to conclude, so what we do in this paper is to circumvent the need of proving something about a statement that we care about. In this case, the the trivial solution would have been to uh, force the sender, Bob, to prove that the function was uh, a permutation in, in some way. And instead of doing that, we use a witness encryption-like approach where if the sender is honest in some sense, he can actually conclude the protocol uh, successfully. Uh, if it's not honest, then he will be stuck at some point and all the information of the honest party will be uh, protected. The first result that we get is this three round protocol that relies only on drop-down permutations and offers security against malicious uh, senders. And what we show is that this protocol can be extended to uh, the case where we also tolerate security against corrupt receivers. On top of that, we show how to turn our protocol into a two-party computation um, uh, protocol that realizes any, any functionality and that uses the underlying trapped permutation in a black box way. So, and also in this case, no uh, certifiability property is required on the trapped permutation. Okay, and with this, uh, I conclude. Thank you very much.